So let's look, let's think about the strains that come about in a uniaxial stress test. So same test. Same test. Let's think about the strains. Let's write down what we know, okay? We wrote down at the end of last class equations for generalized Hooke's law in terms of the, the stresses in terms of the strains. And it was something like this. Now these are the elastic strains, so maybe I'll use a subscript E just to be specific. These are the elastic strains. Okay, but in this scenario, this hypothetical scenario, there's only one stress, sigma 1, 1, so these guys are zero. And we're talking about this sort of, uh, the, the, the idea here is we want to write this for the point, you know, at at yield, so we have something like that, and sigma 2, 2 is equal to minus mu sigma 1, 1. Right? And so, you remember we, we had this assumption that the strain can be decomposed into the elastic part plus the plastic part. And I guess I should say in this particular scenario, we're going to assume that the sigma 1, 1 strain is a boundary condition. I mean, it's, it's basically, we're going to take this bar and we're going to strain it to some value. 20%, right? Where it's clearly plastic, right? So sigma 1, 1 is a boundary condition, right? So that would be this guy. And then we know the elastic strain. How do we determine what the plastic strain is? Well, we don't, you know, the plastic strain is an internal state variable. Right? It's just something that we use to describe all these sort of micromechanical mechanisms that are occurring. Right? In a metal, there's, there's you know, slip across crystallographic planes and could possibly be twinning, other kind of things. Twinning is like an instantaneous reorientation. It could be a lot of things, uh, instantaneous reorientation of the atoms, right, due to deformation. And so there's all this sort of microstructural stuff that's happening that's causing our metal to permanently deform, and we're wrapping up all those microstructural mechanisms and defects into one term we call the equivalent plastic strain. And so we need a sort of constitutive law for the equivalent plastic strain, if you will. And the constitutive law we use, so the, our constitutive law is called a flow rule. So it's basically how the equivalent plastic strain evolves. And it's typically written in terms of rates. So it's usually like the plastic strain rate is proportional to partial F partial sigma ij. All right? Where F, remember, is square root of 3j2 minus y, or pictorially, geometrically, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. F is this surface. This is F. So what is partial F partial sigma ij? It's the normal to that surface. OK? 
okay? And so what basically we're saying that the plastic strain rate evolves, and, and uh, this should be lambda dot, sorry. And, and so, you know, we could write this d epsilon dt, d lambda dt, and then sub divide, or you know, cancel out the dt's, so we could write d e p d lambda partial f partial c i j. This is another way you might write it. And so this is an incremental formulation, or this is called incremental plasticity, because we're, we're basically going to evaluate this incrementally as we march along. We strain a little bit, evaluate, strain a little bit, evaluate. Okay, so this is the normal. Well, I'm going to remember f is equal to zero. So let's rewrite f a little bit, right? If it's equal to zero, then I could rewrite this as j2. I mean, basically, I move y to the other side, square both sides, divide by 3. Squaring both sides of the equation gets rid of the square root sign and adds a squared on the y. Uh, and then I divide by 3 so that I have j2 minus y squared over 3. Everybody okay with that? Everybody okay with what I did? All right. So f, and so another way to write f is j2 minus y squared over 3 equals to 0. Well, let's plug that into, let's evaluate. I'm going to go to the next page. Partial f, partial sigma ij is equal to partial sigma ij j2 minus y squared over Okay. Well, y is a constant, right? It's not a function of sigma ij. So this is, by inspection, going to be 0. And what we're left with is sigma j2, partial j2, partial sigma ij. Look familiar? Those of you that just did your homework? Which? Huh? Yeah, we know it's SIJ. Um, so few people did it correctly on the homework, I want to work it out, OK? Uh, the people that did it correctly did it the long way. <laughs> There's a much shorter way uh, than sort of, the few people that did it correctly kind of wrote out all the components, which is not wrong, but it's not the easiest way to do it, right? So let's, let's work it out, right? So we have partial, partial sigma ij is, right, j2 is 1 half sij. I'm sorry, I'm going to use skl, skl, OK? Technically, it's KLLK, but since we're assuming that this is the Cauchy stress and it's symmetric, so it's so is the deviatoric component, the deviatoric part. Right? Okay, so we can use the chain rule or the product rule to basically say that uh, we have sigma ij SKL times S. KL plus SKL times sigma IJ SKL, right? And that's equal to sigma KL partial, partial sigma IJ SKL, right? So we just need to evaluate partial SKL partial sigma IJ, right? Well, let's plug in the definition. So we have SKL partial, partial sigma IJ, K 
KL minus one third MM sigma KL, right? So then we have S KL. Now we're actually going to, so all, all we've done, so we haven't actually taken a derivative yet. That was just all manipulation. S KL. Now we're actually going to distribute this differential operator and, and compute the derivatives. Right? So we have S KL. Well, the derivative of sigma KL, sigma IJ. I mean, a lot of people, some people tried and got here and then and then didn't quite get this right because, yeah, M sigma MM, yes, sorry. Okay, so a lot of people got to this point but then computed this part wrong. I mean, if you count the free, well, let me just write it like this, sigma KL, sigma IJ, right? minus one third sigma M M sigma I J K L. Right. Well, I mean if you count the free indices in a term, it's gonna give you the order of the tensor, right? So when I say free, I mean not repeated, right? So here you have one, two, three, four. So this should be I mean this without any additional simplification, you, you have to assume that that's some kind of fourth order tensor or something. It's not, I think some people just said this was I, or sigma ij, and it's, it's not, okay? And you can write out the terms to verify it, but what it is, is sigma i, i l sigma k j. And it would work out if you wrote I, K, J, L. It doesn't matter. And then so likewise, what this guy is, is sigma I, M, I'm sorry, delta I, M, delta J, M, delta K, L, right? But this now you have a repeated indice, so you can pass it over. So this is delta ij, all right? So now I'm going to distribute the SKL inside, okay? So I have SKL times delta IL, that's SKI delta KJ minus one-third SKL times delta KL, right, I have a repeated indice so I can distribute it, so that is S K K Yeah. yeah. Alright, so uh, delta KL Right, and so now my first term still has a repeated indice, the k, so I can pass it over. So I say S J I minus one third S K K. This is I J, sorry. I J. Now, this is zero by definition of a deviatoric because S is deviatoric then it's zero. But it, it, a, in general, a repeated indice does not mean it's zero. And for the stress tensor, for the Cauchy stress tensor, sigma, that's not in general true. For a deviatoric, it is, right? So in this case, that's zero, and you get sigma ji equals sigma ij, because it's symmetric. And actually, if I would have just taken the derivatives in a different order here, it, it would have worked out that way that it was IJ. So this or some variant, this, this way or some variant of it is how, you know, I would, I would have done that problem. 
All right. So I think we'll stop there. Uh, basically, you know, just keep in mind where we are is that we had this flow rule, d sigma p is equal to d lambda partial f partial sigma ij, which now we can say is d lambda s ij. Okay. And so this is where we'll pick up next time.